Hi. Hi. So I'm on meditating and I start thinking about natural selection, sexual selection, uh, social programming. I'm thinking about all of our fetishes and our masochisms and our voyeuristic natures. I'm thinking about our inordinate sex practices, our atypical behavioral practices, the masochist sadist uh, dynamics in all of our sort of erotic desires and trying to connect that to natural selection and also connecting this to superstition. And you might be thinking, and this is a whole lot of topics that, that are unrelated or uncorrelated, or are there any links to all of these things? Yes, there is a link because we're dealing with belief. And I told y'all that this is how the Illuminati programmed this whole template of the society so we can operate in our social societies uh, to operate on or, or, or be influenced by superstitions, taboos, um, mythology, uh, mythical belief systems and things of this nature that are based on our cultures and our own personal experiences in combination with biology and our environments, which are heavily influenced and not only our decision makings, but I guess these predispositions that are innate in us, right? I've been talking to you, man, of what's driving our desires for the phallus, if you want to call it inordinate or not. But the reason why I'm calling it inordinate, because it's based on this Christian model of it being a sin and unnatural. So anything that I say that seems like a judgment or a reproof of this type of behavior, please excuse and apologize and uh, overlook any type of judgment that I might have about it. I'm only calling it in order to, in the context of getting you to see how it's now creating the mind patterns of you wanting to do this behavior in a maladaptive way now. So God led me to this book <laughs> that seems so unrelated to my topic today about masochism and exhibitionism. I also want to talk more into uh, auto, what is this word? It has something to do with uh, auto uh, gynophilia. Uh, this is associated with transvestites or transgenders but it's uh, male to female transsexuals who are not exclusively attracted to men, but they fantasize of being in the vessel of a female. What if that means wearing lingerie, wearing female garments, uh, fantasizing about wanting to be in a female role in the sex. So we're gonna go with, talk about all of these. I'm gonna take y'all into the DSM-5 as well. So talk about what does the DSM-5 say about all of these sexual disorders? What we're going to call it atypical sexual desires for the sake of not offending anybody when it comes to these, because I'm also dealing with all of these identities in myself. And I'm just trying to understand, do I have a disorder or if it's just it's something that I just need to have a little bit more of an understanding of I know it's being fueled through my aggressions, the rejections and the loneliness, right? But I wanna go more into this in terms of adaptational. How is this natural selection creating maladaptive patterns for us to just do this as a culture, despite the superstitions and the religion and everything that has been established to forbid us away from this behavior, all of our pedophilic at, uh, ideations and things of this nature. So fetishes, masochisms, exhibitionisms, autogyna, what is that word? Anagynophilia, autogynophilias, uh, sexual masochisms and sadism disorders. Uh, and then we're gonna attach this to ethnicity and culture, transsexual sexuality, characteristics of pedophilic disorders. <laughs> Uh, psychosexual disorders. We're going to start talking about erectile dysfunctions and other psychosexual obstructions 
that is causing men's impotencies to regression to passivity. This could be influencing this autogynophilia as well to want to dress in female clothes and want to be in the vessel of a female, though you are a cis male, okay? So if y'all interested in all of these topics today, I'm also going to also take you into a study that I found uh, that's talking about natural selection. And Freud and his view on narcissism, love, impotence, regression, erotic impulses. Yeah, so a lot is on my mind today, guys. Uh, I got a lot of energy you guys are giving me this morning, and I am going to take y'all pretty quickly on this list today because I don't feel like that I'm going to be uh, getting carried away today. My mind seems pretty focused, and I'm in a good mood today. God woke me up with no anxiety, so if there were witchcraft done on me last night. I didn't feel it. It didn't touch me. So uh, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Your magic didn't work this time. So let's try to pay attention for the next hour. If you're interested in these topics that I've just brought up to you guys, uh, there's a book that I am referencing called The Hidden Symbolisms of Alchemy. And the occult arts. Okay, what does this book have to do with what I was just talking about? Because I told y'all about the sorcery and the witchcraft, right? And the alchemy. And most of our social society is being driven, or the model, the template of how we're being run is being driven by this religion. So I want to understand if I'm questioning this religion due to the parables and the mythology in this book that is making me feel like that my predisposition or something that is biologically, my sexual innate propensities is a sin and unnatural and immoral. I want to understand the sorcery behind this belief system and why this practice is maladaptive to me, which is creating all this intra-psychic conflicts compounded on the guilt and the shame that I am trying to alleviate. And I was able to do that by realizing this was sorcery. I'm not saying that it's untruth, but it is an error. And I'm going to show you how natural selection overrides this error and allows us to carry on maladaptive, adaptational, we can call them adaptational maneuvers for our survival. And sex is one of our survival. So it would make sense to me that we would just adopt sort of inordinate sex practices to, I guess, so we can, I guess, fulfill this preservation mechanism in ourselves. So it's so true that this maladaption is adaptational due to natural selection. So there's a link to this. And I'm going to try to connect this and how all of our exhibitionists and our voyeuristic natures and our fetishes and our inordinate and atypical behavioral practices is also fueling this maladaptions in our society as well. So I guess the moral conclusion will be to get back to some sort of moral model, some, some principles, so we can just be able to decide correctly for ourselves, not correctly based on religion or based on society's acceptance of us. It's all about us right now, understanding who we are, what's driving us, these proclivities, the propensities, and the inclinations. We want to understand, have a full concept of this so we can go on living life, uh, embracing this new world uh, and our sexual liberations uh, in the most adaptive and healthy way. Uh, with no confusions, no uh, equivocalness, and just the most compassion and love for ourselves. It's not built on sin, internal damnations, and all these things that are external, the superstitions and the taboos and all the fears and the guilt and the hiding. This is what's driving and generating this compulsion to want to keep doing it more and more, you know? And I want y'all to to approach this in a different way now. We're going to eradicate guilt. We're going to eradicate it because it was a trick being used by religion 
due to sorcery and alchemy. So I'm pretty sure these Illuminati's figure this out, how to sustain this guilt in the society. And they are aware that this is what's regressing the man as well. They're not going to say anything because they've already given up their manhoods centuries ago. Oh, yeah, them forefathers was... <laughs> They was getting them trans girls out there in them sex forms. Oh, you don't think they was? <laughs> Trust me. So God used me to write a book, Toxicity of War, to tell the story of the narrative. It's put in a point of view of a trans woman. What will her experiences be like as she's being classified in a female gender role on this plantation, which has confused her because she's not being utilized for what she was biologically designed for, right? So naturally this is going to create confusion in her. And I wanted to try to approach this from a psychological standpoint uh, and help y'all to realize that it was these uh, immoral practices, these licentious and profligate immoral practices that really created the virulent conditions and the psychological breakdown in our minds. And the only way to get back to a source of normalcy, harmony in ourselves is to quote of stop this behavior, stop making assumptions or stop self asserting our own, I guess, notions of this identity or what are the behaviors that are associated uh, with this identity and just as I guess start loving ourselves more getting ourselves with knowledge understanding where all these exhibitions nisms and eroticisms and desires are coming from I already have explained to y'all it's coming from rejections loneliness abandonments fears all these eroticisms and wanting to escape it's all coming from feeling unworthy feeling useless uh, and just not feeling seen or heard, uh, feeling unmasculine. A lot of health issues can also, uh, and, th and that's why I'm going to bring up this erectile dysfunction. So without further ado, uh, that was the buildup of this topic today. So if you're interested in learning about all of these different practices that we indulge in uh, with our phallus toy using, and all of our in, inanimate objects that we like to be sexually aroused by, whether it's articles of clothing. Um, it can be any kind of object. Uh, we can have a fetish for feet. Uh, we can have a fetish for smelling people's feet or smelling people's underpits. Uh, I've just heard a lot of interesting fetishes in this LGBT identity. And I was always associating that all of this was just a part of the identity. I just grouped and mailed everything together. Um, but now God has wanted me to just kind of break everything apart and understand myself by understanding this more from the biological sense. Uh, so I can have more compassion for myself when the word pedophilia is being brought up and I unconsciously cringe or shrink, shriek and <laughs> utter guilt in, because I can't separate what I'm doing in private with, I guess, the injunctions that are in society that says that having this significant distress and impairment and my functionings with having by having these intense and sexual urges and fantasies and behaviors are involved because they are involved in this unusual. <laughs> Let me just read this because I'm I'm really just rambling right now. So this is what I start reading. All right, exhibitionism. Oh, there's also a link down in the description. <laughs> uh, there's another video that I made about sadism and masochism, so sort of taking you into some of the history of how that was also, I guess, coined uh, due to a lot of the pro inhibitions that was taking place in England. So the moral panic set in once Christianity came, became invaded in there and they stopped people from practicing other non-traditional 
forms of, of religion and everybody had to uh, adhere to the tenets of Christianity. This naturally created moral panics in that environment to where there was a lot of sanctions and injunctions uh, and a lot of capital punishment back in that time period. So a lot of fear, men are not speaking up and not openly engaging in what they previously was deeming as, I guess, uh, a part of the culture, you know what I mean? <clears throat> then they started labeling and defining things as paraphilia and disorders like exhibitionism with voyeuristic tendencies were all classified under mental disorders. Uh, sexual psychopathies. And this was also in the DSM-5, uh, and they also have made revisions to this. Um, so there are new sexual disorders in the back of this DSM-5. If you are interested in going and buying one of these, I highly recommend it. It helped me to understand a lot of disorders in myself uh, and to understand other people as well around me. So I wouldn't just be writing them off as Looney Tunes. <laughs> <laughs> as I'm throwing the Cocoa Puffs in their mouth because they're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> Exhibitionism. It's an abnormal erotic tendency and an element of our normal psychosexual constitution, okay? But it is if occurring too prominently, it becomes a perversity against which the censor directs its attack. So that's outside censoring. So what's attacking man's right to freely express exhibitionism in our society? Religion, right? Culture is heavily attached to this. Law enforcement as well. He just can't whip out his penis at the baseball game. <laughs> Pig suey razor. No, that's football. Pig suey at the football game. Pig suey razorbacks. Because <laughs> he's a pig guy, right? Oink, oink. <laughs> I know the gays like to use this term pig. Whole concept, another con concept that they have in their mind about what this pig be. Uh, but they equate this with the pig nostrils. Uh, and that usually means getting involved in all these fetishes like fisting, uh, real raunchy sex, that real hardcore stuff that you <laughs> you need a lot of lube for. Uh, so those are the pig communities. Hi, pig community. <laughs> I love my pigs. I love my bears, too. <laughs> So that was terminologies in this gay community about our identities. But exhibitionism is a part of this pig identity as we're fisting, pissing on each other, shitting on each other, and doing all these nasty, raunchy things that is fueling our masochisms. So this is all entailed with exhibitionism. It becomes a perversity uh, if it's occurring too prominently. So that's the distinction of these abnormal erotic tendencies that we have in ourselves. They are an element of a normal psychosexual constitution in us. So repressing them all together is useless when they're just gonna morph and manifest into something else like guilt, depression. So men are finding ways of bringing this up out of them because they realize that they can't live with the anxieties of their depression anymore due to this religion restricting them. Uh, from falling outside of these gender norms, the nuances of those, right? They puzzled the man as he was out raping and pillaging. He realized he wanted to rape the trans and the film boy too. How is this possible? Is this according to nature? It's, why is he feeling, why is his body fueling my aggressions the same as his female? He's asking himself. Because it still arouses penile erections, right? We're going to get into this. Why is this now become normalized in his mind when it's still, is it maladaptive in the society? We're going to just explore that too, as it relates to natural selection and sexual choice or preference. So 
So when it's occurring too prominently and it becomes a perversity against which the censor directs his attack. So religion has justified attacking people who openly display exhibitionisms. It is seen as a forbidden erotic impulse element where the person has an opportunity to do as he likes against the prohibited tendency. The act, the sexual propensity forbidden by the censor or religion in this sense. So your Catholic priest don't have to know that you like dildos, sexual apparatuses. They don't have, they don't have to know that you like sexual, uh, you get psychological balance by using these toys. This is a prohibited tendency in you not to use those due to you believing that sodomy is a sin in yourself. You've learned that in the Catholic church, but now you have an opportunity and you're at your own devices and it's in private and nobody's gonna know about this, right? These are the forbidden erotic impulses as you now have clicked on Pornhub and you're watching trans porn. This is an element and an opportunity for you to do what you like now. Screw that church. <laughs> Screw being a choir boy. I want to be with trans shecock now. <laughs> That's you singing <laughs> to the heavens because you had all that practice as a choir boy. And now you can practice in the bedroom now. <gasps> Let's talk about paraphilia. It's defined as the psychosexual disordering with significant distress or an impairment in the domain of functioning results from a current intense sexual urge, right? You're getting frustrated now that you want to masturbate. You can't get your penis out your zipper fast enough. <sighs> the anxiety's rush to your diaphragm. Uncontrollable right now. I can't take it. I have to jack off underneath my desk in my office. As you put the no disturb to your secretary, leave me alone for 30 minutes. She knows not to come in there. You're indulging in your pedophilia. <laughs> You got all this distress, impairment in your functionings, which brings on these intense sexual urges in you. Now you gotta be watching the porn. Now, this is a company with all of this chronic masturbation underneath your desk at, at work. So inappropriate, right? But this is an impulse, it's impulsing you to do this. It's so intense. And the anxieties won't go away until you turn on the porn and watch just. 10 seconds, you got to see an activity of some porn going on. 10, 15 seconds, you just got to see it immediately. Sexual urges, these fantasies, your fantasies, you got to see these fantasies. This will incite and inspire your behaviors now, generally involving an unusual object now. So it could be your porn, it could be something like maybe some panties that you're sniffing <laughs> as you're masturbating. And you got them in your nose and you're sniffing them and you're acting. Or any situation that could cause this impulse sexual urge in you. The DSM-5 labels them as sexual alterations to objects. Oh, I'm sorry, sexual attractions to objects, situations, or people that deviate from the desires and sexual behaviors that are considered to be socially acceptable. So obviously sniffing underwear underneath your desk at, inside your offices, it deviates from the desires and sexual behaviors that are considered to be socially acceptable because if your uh, assistant walked in, it's a wrap and, she, and your secret is out and you don't want that to be known by her as she's looking at you as trusted, ethical, and competent and moral with your picture of your three kids and your wife. Such a happy, loving family. <laughs> as you put the picture down and take out the underwear that you stole from the stripper that you saw uh, last week at the bar. <laughs> it's Cassandra here and what's the soup of the day? Because <laughs> you're a regular. 
So we know that this is considered socially inappropriate and unacceptable in social and for social acceptabilities. So that's outside. So that's religion. That's culture. But it's not stopping our attractions to these objects, the situations, all the, these people, <laughs> like our fetishes for trans women. Examples of this paraphilia, according to the DSM-5, will be fetishisms, sexual masochism and sadisms, and more. The DSM-5 lists paraphilic disorders under the title voyeuristic disorders. It's an intense sexual arousal from observing an unsuspecting person who is necked in the process of disrobing are engaging in sexual activity as manifested by fantasies, urges, or behavior, hence the word cruising. This is coined in the gay community as going out to public establishments and picking up, I guess, suspecting or unsuspecting pedestrians that are also walking around. I guess getting off this fantasy, this urge is imposing you to, I guess, cruise them, sexualize them. You give them signals, an eye wink, or you lick your lips, and you do something lascivious to, uh, to I guess, signal your attraction uh, for your for solicitation. This is cruising in the L in the gay world, but this is all manifested by our fantasies, the urges of wanting to, I guess, get away with something taboo, the risk of going to jail or getting caught by the cops or by someone else who could see us. <gasps> God, look what's going on behind that tree. The exhibitionist disorder, according to the DSM-5. So we had paraphilic disorder. The next is exhibitionist disorder. The DSM-5 describes this as a reoccurring and intense sexual arousal from the exposure of one's genitals. So pick a boo <laughs> as they're looking at you from around the tree. <laughs> It's an orangutan. <laughs> Look at his hand. <laughs> you gonna learn today? You gonna learn what a big orangutan look like? That. <laughs> but these intense urges are sexual arousals from the exposures of your genitals to an unsuspecting person. They have acted on those sexual urges with an unconsenting person or the sexual urges or fantasies caused causes clinically significant distress. So if this causes distress in you, this is, I guess, class of, will be considered an exhibitionistic disorder. These fantasies are causing clinically significant distress. So just the thought of you going to that park, being behind that tree, exposing yourself, it's like compulsing you. And the fact that you're not able to do it or you're being restrained by something, it's distressing you even more. DSM-5 defines sexual masochisms disorder as an intense sexual arousal from the act of being humiliated, beaten, bound, are otherwise made to suffer as manifested by fantasies, urges, or behaviors. Can that include sodomy? Yes, it can, because it's a form of humiliation. And it usually in, uh, evokes pain in you uh, to do this act. Sexual sadism disorder is an intense sexual arousal from the physical or psychological suffering of another person as manifested by fantasies, urges, or behaviors. Can we say that the conditions of slavery was satanistic in nature? Yes, we can, because people suffered and people got aroused by this. This fueled so many of these white males, erotic fixations and desires, and they wasn't unfulfilled because they were able to dispel all their aggressive or, or rage and uh, on on these slaves so these were definitely uh satanistic in practice all these sexual arousal intense urges 
for physical and psychological suffering of a group of people, which was the black people. And this is still being manifested in our fantasies with pornography and all of their other urges as well and behaviors. Are we dealing with a disorder when it comes to the society now? Let's get to this. Let's talk about fetish, fetishistic disorders. These are sexual arousals from either the use of non-living objects or a highly specific focus on non-genital body parts like feet, armpits, hair. The fetish objects are not limited to articles of clothing used in cross-dressing or devices used for genital stimulation like vibrators and dildos. So there could be other things as well that can incite this fetishistic disorder in us. You only know, only you know what you're fetishing right now, what, you, what gets you off, what you crave. So this is fetishistic disorders, sexual sadism disorders, sexual masochism disorders, and we had paraphilic disorders. So these were the four in the DSM-5 that are listed on the sort of these, uh, these disorders, paraphilia and exhibitionisms. We have idol gyne, uh, gyne, gynophilia. This is a male to female transsexual who are not exclusively attracted toward men. They are instead sexually oriented toward the thought or image of themselves as a woman. We can call these people transvestites, cross-dressers. We know that they're out there, right? We know that they're wearing lingerie. We know that they want to be in the vessel of a woman to transmute or whatever for completeness sake or whatever, or just to have psychological balance or to regress because they don't feel manly or due to some trauma, sexual assault. Anything could cause this autogynophilia in a person. Is it homosexual? Let's get into this. So we know it's a male to female transsexual who are not exclusively attracted to men. They are instead sexually oriented toward the thought or the image of themselves as a woman. They are sexually aroused by the thoughts or images of self as a female. They have a gender identity that is distinct from their sexual orientation. So they can be into a woman, but their gender identity is distinct from being into the woman. And it's also incongruent with their physical sex. So it doesn't matter if they're a man or a man, they can still be into other men or get to be into the woman but they still want to be a female, though they consider themselves to be cis male and be attracted, sexually oriented towards females. That's how it's distinct and incongruent to their physical sex, unless they go and get, I guess, become a full transsexual and get their, go through reassignment surgeries and stuff like that. But even transgenders will argue against calling themselves autogynophilia or having this autogynophilia, autogynophilia because their attractions to men is associated with love and intimacy as well. And I guess with the autogynophilia, they just see themselves as one, they're just sexually aroused by being in the female vessel. So they experience sexual arousals at the idea of having a female body. I guess that is distinct from transgenderisms. This refers to the full gamut of erotically arousing cross-gender behaviors, rather than practice, rather than sex, dressing, behaving, thinking, and all their fantasies as well. But it's referring to the gamut of erotically arousing cross-gender behaviors and fantasies. The proposed nature of the relationship between the autogynophilia and gender dysphoria is unclear. 
and the desire to live as a woman often remains as strong or stronger after an initial sexual response to the idea has faded. So it doesn't even go away. No, those strong initial sexual responses to want to be in that female vessel fades away. Uh, my desire to wear lingerie faded away. But did the idogynophilia go away? No, because I still want to be in a female role sexually with the use of this phallus toy. Desire to live to be a woman in this role remained intact in me, though the initial sexual response faded or of the idea faded away. So I know that I'm not transgender. So I got that out of my mind and I have a clear sense of my own in the individuation right now and myself and my gender, but that didn't get away, get over that, the fantasies or uh, the erotic fantasies of wanting to be in the female body. But though I know that I'm a cis man, this is because autogynophilia causes a female gender identity to develop, which becomes an emotional attachment and something aspirational to its own right. So the gynophilia disorder is causing the female gender identity to develop onward now. So you go from lingerie to now you're doing laser hair removals and you're growing your hair out and it's just slowly started to just develop until you wanted to embody this female. And you become emotionally attached to all of this as well. This has become your identity now. It's something aspirational in your own right. So it don't matter if people, it is not mattering to you that people think that you're transgender or transsexual. You just want, you just want breasts. That's all you know. And that's all you desire. Some transgender people dispute and argue that the concept of autogynophilia unduly sexualizes trans women's gender identity because of the eroticism, erotic nature of them, uh, how they want to embody this female. I guess it's in the erotic domain or the sexual domain of their, fa of their, of their personalities. Uh, has it been integrated now to where this becomes like more of an, a lifestyle for them? In a study by Charles Allen Moser, he's an American physician who specializes in transgender health, clinical sexologist, he's a therapist and sex educator. He found that not that not substantial, there was no substantial difference between autogynophilia and homosexual transsexuals in terms of gender dysphoria. And it is unclear, and it is unclear. And autogenetic autogynophilia is not predictive of the behavioral behavior, history, and motivation of trans women. Let me repeat this. So this American physician found no substantial difference between autogynophilic and homosexual transsexuals. So the homosexual transsexual will be a person who is attracted to the same sex and they go about altering their body to match that of how they feel on the inside of themselves, which is like a woman. So they just get the breasts and they become the transsexual like this. And they're attracted to the, to the same sex, to men. This is the male to female. And this is in terms of gender dysphoria. So there is no difference between this autogynophilic person who just wants to dress up like a woman and wants and is aroused by thinking of themselves and being in a female vessel and posted this. And this person could be also into women. It was like Caitlyn Jenner, right? When she was married, she would be considered somebody that's autogynophilic and posted to be a homosexual transsexual because she's a t still attracted that didn't do it, uh, affect her, I guess, sexual orientation uh, and post to her sexual biology and her, her biological sex. 
So that's the difference. The homosexual transsexual is attracted to the man. In terms of gender dysphoria, it is unclear. Like I just said, Charles states that it is not always absent in trans women attracted. It is not always absent in trans women attracted to men. And it is not the primary motivation for trans women to seek sex reassignment surgery. Charles states that it is not always absent in trans women, this gender dysphoria. It is not always absent in trans women. Oh, I'm sorry, not gender dysphoria, but the autogynophilia is not absent in trans, it's not always absent in trans women. So I guess that's to imply that they could also be into women as well who are attracted to men. So it's not always absent in trans women attracted to men. And it is not the primary motivation for trans women to seek sex reassignment surgeries, this idogynophilia. In 2001, there was a study by Larry, Larry Nutbrock who reported that idogynophilia like characteristics were strongly associated with a specific general cohort as well as the ethnicity of the subject and may become a fading phenomenon. So let's look at general cohorts. What does this mean? It refers to, it's a social science or a concept that a generation of individuals uh, share that are born around the same time and living at the same age and have similar ideas, problems, and attitudes. An example of this would be the baby boomers and the millennials will think more alike imposed to the Gen Zs and versus uh, the Gen Alphas. They will have more of a similar ideas, problems, and attitudes. Uh, based on their age group. So that's the difference between, that's what a generational cohort is. This study said that generational cohorts also compared and also with the ethnicity of the subject is associated with autodynophilia. Wanting to be a woman. Is this what not happening in our society right now with these men wanting to regress? Whether they want to be the bottom or they want to be in a lingerie while doing it. But they want to be in this female role. They want to be dominated. They want to be in lingerie. They want to be submissive in a relationship. Do they have this I know guy lefidia? It's something interesting to look into of what's creating all of this in our society. We can say it's maladaptive, but that doesn't change natural selection. And it's being influenced because the veil has been lifted on this moral piece. Uh, and now these generational cohorts, i.e. the Gen Zs and the Gen Alphas is just adopting the belief that autogynophilia is normal without even looking in or researching into it or what that, I guess the associated links or the causations, the causalities uh, of the probability of now wanting to be a woman or be fantasized about being with a, be in a female vessel uh, and getting some sort of erotic gratification from this fantasy. But it's a fading phenomenon, but Let's look at ethnicity because this is influencing this and these generational cohorts as well. This autogynophilia. This was strongly associated with generational cohorts and ethnicity. Think about it in terms of social conditioning and how they treated us in slavery. They trained us to be autogynophilic in nature. A lot of us due to these conditions and the environments and this is also just being associated with black people. So everything else biological uh, phenomenon could occur as well due to the licentiousness and the profligacy and the immorality of our sex practices, what's creating hermaphroditisms, uh, 
babies with anomalous genitalia and things of this nature. So don't you think that it would also affect our propensities and inclin and I guess our attractions and I guess what we consider to be erotically desirable? So let's talk about transsexual sexuality. After we've talked about autogynophilia, let's talk about transsexual sexuality. It is an attraction to men while feeling oneself to be a woman. So this person feels themselves to be a woman, whereas the autogynophilic just is a sexually aroused by the fantasies of being a woman. But they know that they are man. That's the difference, if you're wondering. And this is a factor to distinguish a transsexual from a transvestite or crossdresser who is a man who feels himself to be one. Transsexual sexuality is reflected in not only penile response to erotic stimuli, but it also includes the capacity for pair bonding formations and romantic love. So the question now to this man who's cross-dressing who was sexually aroused and fantasized about being in this woman vessel, are you also including the capacity for pair and bond formations, whatever object of your desire and romantic love? Now that you want to be in this female role, ask yourself this, this could distinguish your, I guess, form or more, have a clear concept of your individual when it's coming up, when it's forming around individuation when you're trying to understand your identity in terms of gender. Are you a transsexual? Are you a, are you autogynophilic? Are you just a freak? <laughs> Let's look at some characteristics of paraphilic disorders. Most people with atypical sexual interests do not have a mental disorder, okay? So I'm asking myself, is it a mental disorder that I'm supposed to use this dildo and want to be in this female role? And it's saying that these characteristics of paraphilic disorders are these atypical sexual interests, atypical means unusual, these interests do not have a mental disorder. The DSM-5 requires that people with paraphilic disorders have these interests. You either feel personal distress about your interests, which I don't, not merely distress resulting from society's disapproval. This is coming in interest psychically from within you. You just feel distress. And it got nothing to do with society's disapproval of this. Or... You have a sexual behavior involving unwilling persons or a person unable to give legal consent. To define the lines between an atypical sexual interest and a disorder, the names of these disorders is revised to differentiate between the behavior itself and the disorder stemming from that behavior, i.e. like sexual masochisms in the DSM-5 it's titled sexual masochism disorder. So that's how they distinguish masochism from sexual masochism disorder. The behavior itself and the disorder stemming from that behavior. It is a subtle but crucial difference that makes it possible for an individual to engage in consensual atypical sexual behaviors without inappropriately being labeled with a mental disorder. So all I have to do in society is just make this socially acceptable. Now, now everybody's into sodomy, masochisms, sadists and masochists and stuff like that. So just make it appropriate in a society, make it culturally a cultural norm. Just remove the taboos and the superstitions and the sins as a construct in the mind. How do you do this over time as you're having, I guess, civilization is having this sort of evolution lag of just trying to catch up to everybody just accepting this now. There is a lag right now because people still attest to this moral model, uh, but this is soon as gonna change. <laughs> I know Christians don't wanna hear that, but 
y'all ain't doing enough to try to combat the forces of this natural selection that is just arising as a natural phenomenon. So y'all gonna sit back and watch all of this just natural selection just occur. It's gonna manifest. And nobody's gonna think of it as a disorder because it's being socially accepted. <laughs> but it's a subtle and crucial difference that makes it possible for an individual to engage now in sodomy and consensual atypical sexual behaviors and inordinate sex practices without inappropriately being labeled with a mental disorder or being a sin or it being unnatural, getting some sort of social sanction and injunctions in the society or in the culture. The DSM-5 clearly distinguishes between atypical sexual interests and mental disorders involving these desires or behaviors. The paraphilic disorder includes eight conditions for it to be a disorder. You have exhibitionistic disorder. Oh, I'm sorry. So these conditions is in paraphilic disorders is exhibitionistic disorder, fetishistic disorders, uh, fraturistic disorders, pedophilic disorders, sexual masochism disorders, sexual sadism disorders, and transvestite disorders and voyeuristic disorders. These are labeled under the paraphilic disorders. But it is possible to be a masochist or a sadist and not it and not it be a disorder. I just want y'all to know that. Let's talk about sexual disorders. Psychosexual, this is how I was able to actually link this to natural selection. My mind sort of derailed from all of these different uh, atypical uh, sexual interests that we have. And because it's so maladaptive and, and confusing in our society, it's created all this aggression and rape, uh, sexual coercions in people. I can only assume that it's coming from a disorder, right? So what's fueling this disorder? Let's talk about sexual disorders cause how it's causing impotence in our men right now. This is also an emasculating tactic that's also being employed by the mass manipulators in our society, also called social conditionings. This is what's causing y'all impotence and one of our regrets right now. And y'all fantasies of being in this female role and in the female vessels and doing everything that's attached to the gender of a female this dude could be doing to your psychosexual obstructions. This is infantile sexual development. It causes impotence and it's defined as the sexual problems that are psychological in origin and occur in absence of any pathological disease. They often arise because of physical, environmental, or psychological factors and difficult to separate from, an, from one another. This can lead to erectile dysfunctions, ED, caused by diabetes, okay? And I start thinking, hmm, that's funny. So diabetes can lead to erectile dysfunctions. Ain't got nothing to do with any pathological disease, right? Or is it? Yeah. Pathological in origin occur in absence of pathological diseases. But diabetes is a pathological disease in Black African Americans have a high risk for type 2 diabetes and genetic traits and the prevalence of obesity and insulin resistance. And these all contribute to the risk of diabetes in the African-American community. So we are at higher prone risk of erectile dysfunctions, uh, which is fueling this psychosexual disorder in us. This has a link to now going back to regression and wanting to be in the female fantasies or wanting to be in that female role because you're not feeling manly. So your masculine prerogatives are being undermined simply by the conditions of your health that is being uh, influenced by your environment. But you all, you automatically think that 
well, African Americans already have a high risk of proneness to it. So you're not attributing it to natural selection or the adaptation of this natural selection in y'all the conditions, the virulent conditions in your environment just create, I guess, activated or triggered this genetical trait in you. And now you have this diabetes and this is affecting now your erectile dysfunctions to where you have to be with this trans woman. Think about that and make the links to this so you can stop accusing yourself of being homosexual and attaching it to a moral sin. And you don't have to do all of that. It's all biologically Im implicated. And we know that according to a 2011 study by Larry Nutbrock, that autogynophilia is associated with ethnicity and generational cohorts like our Gen Z's and Gen Alphas, referring to people who are around the same age, who have similar ideas, problems, and attitudes. This signifies to me social conditioning as the environmental cause of this idogynophilia. And African-American men are at a greater proneness of this condition due to predispositions to health risks like diabetes that causes erectile, erectile dysfunctions and that affects masculinities right there. So it's likely that regression in our civilizations, in our societies, will ensure fantasies of wanting to be in the body of a woman as an escape or fantasy from feeling impotent or unmasculine are in distress in your environment. So you naturally you just want to regress into that female. Psychology has figured this out. This is the sorcery of how they figured it out by using alchemy with religion, by maintaining uh, sin, superstition, and taboos in us. It's all sorcery, guys. It's witchcraft. All of, all of our not being able to accept our identities is all witchcraft. <laughs> And your erectile dysfunctions and other psychosexual obstructions is going to ensure this as well. This masculinity crisis or problem that you're dealing with, this regression, we're just going to call it a regression. It's going to ensure that you're going to be fantasizing and wanting to be in, this, in the body of a woman. You might disagree with me, but on certain levels, when you're with that trans woman, you kind of want to be in a female vessel, right? Which, as she's giving it to you, right? You kind of want to have her body in that sense. But she becomes the artifact because you're not gonna, you're not transgender. You don't have any gender dysphoria. But she's the artifact of what's subconsciously going on and in inside of you. Your regressions will ensure your fantasies and the behavior. And the body to be in this body of a woman, or to be in a behavioral uh, sex practices of a woman, and this is all on the fuel your escapisms, your fantasies, due to your feelings of impotencies, feeling unmasculine, and being distressed by all of this. This is a racial disparity, and a systematic way to predispose us to the ideation simply by our circumstances. This autogynophilia. Can you imagine that? It's happening. Socioeconomic status, uh, disparities are affecting this economy, and along with uh, with this moral piece, it's all compounded to create all this intrapsychic conflicts in us. It's almost likely we're going to regress. Regression is, is a result of all of this. Sometimes one condition may lead to another. For an example, Erectile dysfunctions caused by diabetes may cause depression in you, which may lead to hypoactive sexual desire. So your desires in decreases, which are hyperactive sexual desires, persistent or reoccurring absence of sexual fantasies and desires for sexual activity. So all of this is going to decrease in you. The persistence or the reoccurring absence of sexual fantasies and desires so you no longer you lose interest in sex with the woman but you still want to be kind of sexually active right i guess to feel adequate as a man so you naturally just be in this role with the trans woman 
causing. But this all causes personal distress or interpersonal difficulties in you, which is composting you or pushing you or driving you to now want to have an alternative route with this woman that you feel so inadequate with due to this erectile dysfunctions. And the ED may arise due to guilt, your guilt, stress, anxieties, nervousness, worry, fear, depression, uh, distorted body image, physical or emotional trauma, rape, abuse. These all are influencing your guilt, stress. All of these are going to be interpersonal difficulties in you. Now, can you think of something that's actually causing these? Religion. So we can just relate everything back to the sorcery that's sustaining and maintaining your guilt, your stress, the anxieties, all your nervous and worry and fear and depression. So right now you have a distorted body image now to where you think yourself as wanting to be in this female role or have a female body. I mean, your hands kind of fat, you know what I mean? Bent over, it looks like a female, right? At least that's what that trans girl is saying. And all your physical, emotional, all your traumas. <laughs> we know we've, we have a host of traumas. A lot of us went through molestations, rape, and abuse. Can we say attribute that to our erectile dysfunctions or any psychosexual disorders that we might be having? Along with diabetes, high blood pressure, things like this, this is all affecting us. In addition, ignorance, misinformation, superstition, and improper sex education contributes towards these psychosexual disorders as well. So they figured let's miseducate them in the school system and misinform them about, I guess, the health benefits of anal sex as we're calling it a sin which keep them in ignorance of the benefits of anal sex and is going to keep them in superstitions at, at thinking that this practice is improper or, or immoral or unnatural this is all being sustained sustained by their by the education that we've been fed this miseducation and through the religious piece as well that has contributed to our psychosexual disorders they have realized this psychologically i want y'all to know we're over here blaming each other, and this is all due to the establishments of how they've been teaching us in the society about our sex, our sexual identities. All the sex education is misinformed. It's misinformation because uh, that's not the way they're practicing it. This is all ignorance, and it's an, it's an error. So this brought me to my mind to, could we possibly be adapting Natural selections could be a just creating adaptational maneuvers to maintain a maladaptive behavioral practice that has no causal link or no causality to the probability of whatever we're doing. There's a possibility, and it's a high probability that we could be carrying on maladaptive behaviors that have no link to the causations of what we're thinking that the cause is. But there's a, there's a science to all of this, and I'm going to get to this. Sometimes conflict of values arise between the sexual feelings during adolescence and in those that are represented by family or religion. Sometimes the conflicts of our values will arise between sexual feelings during adolescence and those that are represented by family or religion. So it's not the family and religion's belief that homosexuality is going to be accepted right so this is going to create a conflict of values in yourself as you find yourself being attracted to the same biological sex another example of this will be the attitude that sex is dirty sinful or shameful marital discord can also lead to triggering psychosexual disorders Psychosexual disorders may be categorized as sexual dysfunctions, paraphilic, and gender identity disorders. The prevalence of male sexual disorders range from 10 to 52%. It's pretty high. 
That's why we got to take this serious now when it comes to these psychosexual disorders, because this is also being uh, causing our autogynophilic disorders as well. Wanting to be in this female role, they realize this psychologically. Erectile dysfunctions prevalence is three to 15%. Premature ejaculations is four to 8%. And male hypoactive sexual desire disorder is one to 7%. But the highest is this sexual disorder. And that could be from paraphilic, gender identity. These are all sexual dysfunctions and sexual disorders. And, okay, improper nurturing in America during development of secondary sexual characters, along with misinformation, superstitions by our religions, there are few factors leading to such disorder. So our religion has created the disorder in us due to misinformation of our secondary sexual characters because they automatically deem it to be a sin. So we cannot even nurture this in ourselves if it's improper in America, in our religion. And we've just been developed to see this as superstitious. These are factors that are leading to such disorders in us. As a result of being repressed, they have the put peculiarities of being in general and inaccessible to consciousness. So with these repress, with the repression of religion, creating the repression or the influence of religion, creating the repressions in us, peculiarly of being peculiarity, the peculiarity of being in general, uh, inaccessible to consciousness. So we cannot, it, access to consciousness, those repressed emotions of those psychosexual conflicts that we're having due to the sustainment of guilt and shame on the superstitions and the taboos of our religion. It has repressed this and now it's not even in our conscious awareness. So when I'm telling you guys karmically that men's pro proclivities and propensities are now rising up from the ashes, that is what this is, is it's due to the development of how they saw their sexual characteristics due to them being misinformed about the heterosexualities in this construct and the sustainment of their superstitions in this religion. This has been the factor to why they wanted to regress due to these disorders in them. As a result of being repressed, they have the uh, peculiarity of being in general inaccessible to the conscious. Freud speaks particularly of cross egotistic actuations or i.e. narcissism. Freud says of this in regard to love, having one's love returned, restoring one's self-regard and replenishes one narcissism. So narcissists are replenished by being in love and having that love reciprocated to them. This restores one's own self-regard. Oh, someone loves me, right? But they also figure that they have to show love. But the narcissist has figured, I'll just show love with sex or control or domination in this way. But they all, this is a way for them to replenish uh, those self regards that they have for themselves due to that narcissism when they are able to be in, in a loving relationship, which is why they always want to be in a loving relationship. They got to be in a relationship. They jump from one relationship to the next because this is all feeling their own self regard and it replenishes their narcissism. Disturbances in the love relationship will be a disturbance in this love connection with plot impotence or the repressions of erotic impulses which leads to various kinds of psychological disturbances these are disturbances in love relationships this is a threat to the narcissist as he's knows he's dealing with erectile dysfunctions and he's dealing with also 
I guess, fears of not being able to perform in the bedroom. This is going to disturb or to in this is all repressed erotic impulses that will lead to various kinds of psychological this, this will lead to psychological disturbances. Re regression is a kind of psychic retrogression and reaching back towards infantile memories and wishes of sexual material. For the individual, his behavior is destined to draw off of unconscious emotions that are repressed in the course of the evolution of civilization. So, in my ethical, so in mythical or religious fantasies, a whole people liberates itself from the maintenance of its psychic soundness from those primal impulses that are stubborn or unmanageable. This is natural selection right here. To culture, like superstition and taboos, whose behaviors arise through the incorrect assignment of cause and effect. Listen, we got primal impulses. These primal impulses are stubborn, are unmanageable in our society. This is to culture, like superstitions and our taboos. These are primal impulses. Superstition and taboos, they become stubborn or obstinate or unmanageable in the society, though we're trying to change the idea of sodomy and the idea of what's deemed heterosexual or homosexual. These taboos and superstitions are gonna be obstinate and in place due to these primal impulses in us to, to not want to change. We're going to say also that these superstitions and taboos that is informing our behaviors arise through the incorrect assignment of cause and effect. So I have to feel guilty because this Bible is saying that sodomy is a sin. This becomes an incorrect assignment of cause and effect because the effect of me feeling guilty cannot be a, appropriately associated with the cause of it being a sin because this was only being derived by taboos and superstitions. So this is an error, but it can still be allowed to adapt and maintain in the society. And we can just go along maladaptive and just adapt this into the society. This is how I realized that black men stopped having stop. We didn't stop having sodomy practices after we left the plantation. Though we kept our superstitions and taboos intact, we just created a download culture. Natural selection created this naturally. So it's never gonna go away, no matter how much we try to demonize it right now. But is this behavior is rising through an incorrect assignment of cause and effect, or he's not even thinking about the cause at all as he's engaging in this, but it's a leading to an intuitive inequality that shows that natural selection can favor strategies that lead to frequent errors in assessment and an extended model identifies conditions under which natural selection can favor associating events that are never causally related. Can y'all understand what I just said? These conditions under which natural selection can favor associating events like licentiousness and profligacy with now homosexual activities, these events that are never causally related are now identified as conditions under which natural selection can favor associating events. So now we can have a download culture now, just simply by it, uh, these conditions of natural selection favoring these associated events that are never causally related. In conclusion, behaviors which are or appear superstitious are an inevitable features of adaptive behaviors like out of way like baby baking in all organisms include including ourselves it is it is an incorrect establishment of cause and effect so the whole slavery pretext was an error in human society 
It created everything, the inevitable superstitions in our behavior. It is an incorrect establishment, they're calling it, of cause and effect, a belief or practice resulting from ignorance, fear of the unknown, or a false conception of causations. And our false conceptions of causation is that we said it came from slavery, right? But how do we prove this when we don't have any accounts of it occurring in slavery? They also figured this out as well. Stupid shit. Stup Superstition becomes adaptive outcomes of a general belief engine. This is an engine is propelling people to just believe in this superstitions that sodomy is wrong, homosexual activity is wrong. All this ignorance and the fear of the unknown or a false conception of causations. All it came from slavery. These are all slave practices. They generalize it like this. This is what maintains the superstition. It becomes adaptive outcomes of a general belief engine, which involves which evolved to both reduce anxieties in us. So in order to not to feel anxieties and, and to enable humans to make causal associations due to maintaining superstitions, it, adapt, it has an adaptive outcome of a general belief engine, which evolved to both reduce anxieties in us and enable humans to make causal associations. Whether they was true or not, or false or not, or an error or not, we made a causal association that slavery was the pretext that created all of this. But we're so far removed from it, we don't have no knowledge of it. Natural selection is just picking up these behavioral practices up regardless due to the individual. As long as the cost of a falsehood error is high enough, natural selection can favor strategies that frequently make errors and generate superstitions. As long as the cost of a falsehood error is high enough, natural selection can favor strategies that frequently make errors and generate superstitions. So as long as they maintain religion and the superstitions in this Bible, Natural selection is going to favor these strategies of keeping the download cultures going and people are just going to go on uh, making these errors in their behaviors because they're going to be generated by superstitions in them. The cost of paraphilia and homosexuality was death, right? And this is what it said in scripture. Because these, you remember, the cost has of the falsehood has to be high enough for the natural selection, for the adaptive quality to take effect to natural selection, to for these, I guess, behavioral practices to now be favored as a new strategy in our in our civilizations. Though it it has made errors, and we know that this practice has had made errors in natural selection. And is what has been generated or maintaining our superstitions too. So the cost of this paedophilia, paraphilia, and homosexuality was death by religion. So naturally, this maintained the falsehood error and causation of sin. That's how they made it high enough, leading to the evolution of superstition and superstitious behavior. This captures the causal link between the conditions when a response is evolutionarily favored, but the causal link may be lacking, like sexual immorality is linked to homosexuality. Let me read all of this again. What I just said about the cost of the falsehood in the era being high enough for natural selection can favor the new strategies that frequently make errors and generate superstitions, since we know that natural selection don't favor don't necessarily i guess favor if something is an error or the truth or not 
it's just picking it up by, I guess, by us maintaining it through our behavioral practices. Whether it's true or sin or not, natural selection is not picking that up in our environment. That's why it's so detrimental to, I guess, re reference everything out of the Bible. Because it's not dealing with nature, <laughs> which is what is influencing us. But they have made sure and maintained that we're going to maintain our superstitions and the guilt and the shame due to the cost of the falsehood being high. Because it's the rage of sin is death in the Bible. So you see how they was able to psychologically uh, do the reverse psychology to make you. Oh, just keep going, Cornelius. I just want you to understand how they've been using the sorcery in the, in this Bible by maintaining our guilt and shame. By making the punishment or the wage of this act uh, applied to death or is appropriate to death by religious to naturally this maintain the falsehood error and the causations of sin. Obviously this maintained this superstition, the falsehood of error and the causations of sin leading to the evolution of superstition and the superstitious behavior, hence our download culture. This captures the causal link between the conditions when a response is evolutionary favored, but the causal link may be lacking. The conditions with the response. This captures the causal link between the conditions when a response is evolutionary favored, but the causal link may be lacking since we don't have any knowledge of everything that happened in slavery, right? like sexual immorality. So now our understanding of sexual immorality is linked to homosexuality without any real causal link of it being linked to slavery is what I'm saying. Even though sexual immorality and poverty and licentiousness was definitely attributes of slavery, can we say that this is linked to homosexuality as well? Well, this link is lacking and ca the causal link is lacking due to lack of information and knowledge about what happened in slavery, which is why they had to keep this knowledge obscure and hidden from us, our conscious awareness about what everything that took place, it's particularly when it comes to sodomy, para paraphilia, which were definitely going on uh, in slavery. Why do we don't know anything about this stuff when it's affecting our men so much? So they're ensuring that this is going to maintain our superstitious superstitions and our superstitious behavior. The conditions seem to be favored by natural selection now that we are practicing openly sodomy, though the causal link is lacking due to either denial, superstitions, uh, taboos, and regression. Assigning causal probabilities and in incomplete errors in civilizations, the prior event is the causal event rather than a non-causal one. Let me repeat that. Assigning causal probabilities and incomplete errors in civilizations, the prior event is the causal event rather than a non-causal one. So by the fault in civilizations, whatever happened previously in, in civilization is the causal, whatever that causal event was, rather than a non-causal one, is the reason why we're still carrying on the probabilities of all of these practices. And when events are causally associated with the latter events, it drives any response. And this can be applied to innate responses as well due to prior events. <laughs> Appreciating the biological basis for such simple responses emphasizes that organisms will frequently display behavioral responses that appear poorly adapted to a particular situation like slavery. The existence of superstitious behavior are part of adaptive strat strategy 
provides an alternative explanation for behaviors that might otherwise be seen as maladaptive mistakes or a poor match between a species and a changing environment. This is not to suggest that all behaviors are adaptive. Indeed, an evolutionary lag following a changed environment provides another route to superstitious behavior. Indeed, an evolutionary lag following a changed environment provides another route to superstitious behavior. So though we got removed from the slave plantation, those sodomist, those sodomy practices, the lagging of this practice is still lagging in our environment. Which provides another route to our superstitious behaviors and doing it in the hush hush, whereby an organism associates two events that once were like slavery, but are no longer causally related. So we can no longer blame slavery, but they're still being influenced or being associated events. Um, we can we don't have to associate this, but they're still being influenced in us, but are no longer causally related. For example, Jim Crow is removed, but blacks still fear whites, or licentiousness and privacy occurred in slavery, but out of wedlock babies are still continuing over a hundred years later. In particular, the inability of individual humans to assign causal probabilities to all sets of events that occur around them will often force them to lump these causal associations with non-causal ones. Thus, natural selection will favor strategies that make many incorrect causal associations in order to establish those that are essential for survival and reproduction. So this man's attraction to this phallus of the trans woman, it's just the causal causations are the association, the causal associations of previous events that happened in our society. And these non-causal events is inducing him to now want to be with this trans woman due to natural selection, favoring the now strategy of his him valuing or I guess trying to preserve his life by surviving. Since he knows he can't reproduce with this trans woman. So he has to now associate it with his survival now. He just does this automatically. This becomes a causal association when it could be some non-associated event like slavery, the prophecy and the licentiousness and the moral practices of slavery created these conditions and the natural selection started to favor this new strategy of just saying sex at all costs for his survival. So naturally he's gonna go to the thing, whatever appeals to his inordinate sex drive is an infantile sexual development and is edible conflicts and this is how this also is being compounded on with the superstitions and stuff but it's not stopping the behavior because he's seeing it as the causal link i hope all this made sense to you guys i didn't expect to be talking so long today about this topic but it is associated with all of this exhibitionisms our sexual sadistic and masochistic fetishistic disorders. This could also be playing into our cross-dressing, transvestite and autogynophilia uh, fantasies and escapisms or want to be in the female vessel associated with diabetes, which is creating these sexual disorders in us, ethnicity and generational cohorts also influence uh, where an adaptation, adaptation latches on to civilization. And just some of the characteristics of paraphilic disorders in us uh, that we just need to be aware of. Uh, so I hope you guys learned something today. Have a wonderful day. Ciao.